Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 57 of the American Muslim Experience. My name is Zaki Hassan, and I'm joined, as always, by my friend, Pervez Ahmed. Hey, welcome. Welcome, Zaki, and welcome, listeners. Good to have you guys back. Uh, how are you doing, Zaki? It's been a minute. It, it, it's been uh, a few minutes, but i um, happy to be up here on a Sunday morning. It's We, we usually record... Uh, in, in the wee small hours, so kind of nice that it's daylight out. <laughs> it is nice indeed. And, uh, yeah, it's been it's been great. It's been a good uh, couple of weeks, I uh, imagine, on your end as well. Well, and, and we've got uh, a lot of heavy uh, subject matter to talk about this episode, so let me go ahead and introduce our guest, returning guest, uh, Omar Muzaffar. Omar, assalamu alaikum. Thanks for coming on. It's an honor so Omar is the Muslim chaplain at Loyola University of Chicago. He addresses theological, personal, social matters for students of all sectarian outlooks. And during the school year, he also runs classes on scripture, student life, and other matters. Normally, we have Omar on at the end of the year uh, for our annual uh, Talking Star Wars with Omar Muzaffar episode, which has become a tradition after two years. Uh, we're not doing that this time around, but hopefully uh, we can look forward to that in a few months. Uh, what are we talking about this time, Professor? Well, it's funny you actually say that because when I, you know, when, when I when I pinged uh, Omar and Omar, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I, I, I reached out to you and you were like, "Hey, uh, what's up? Yeah, I'd love to be on the show, but uh, there's no Star Wars movie out. So what what, 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 what are we talking about?" <laughs> uh, now, now I have to ask. I don't know if you were being sort of tongue in cheek or you were actually being genuine about your question about the uh, <laughs> about the Star Wars movie. <laughs> both. Uh, okay. Both. Uh, wow, you pulled that <laughs> off. Um, so, yes, uh, Omar, uh, well, thank you, first of all, again, for being on the show. And, uh, you know, for, I, I, to be honest with you, I, I, think, I, I think we've done we've done our listeners and we've done certainly, I think, Omar a disservice uh, in the past of having him on, although his input on Star Wars is always welcomed and, uh, and, and so meaningful and useful. Uh, but I think we've, uh, we, we've uh, as I said, undermined uh, the, 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 the sort of full scope of what Omar brings to any conversation, let alone this particular conversation. Um, this is true. I mean, I can talk about Star Wars. I can talk about <laughs> Star Trek. I can talk about <laughs> Alien. <laughs> That's true. So we have limited you. See, see, I, I, I'm, I'm being, I'm being right. I'm, I'm not being facetious. We have limited you. Um, no, but, but you know, it, it, I guess, I guess there's no proper way to transition from this. But uh, yeah, no, yeah. Uh, no, I mean, we're going to be talking about some, I think, some, some heavier sort of, uh, or doing, doing some slightly more heavy lifting and 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 uh, meteor stuff, heavier stuff. Um, and that is uh, Omer. Uh, now I know for a while, for the last few years now, um, you've been. Um, kind of doing, I don't know if it's just limited to the Chicago community, but also beyond, uh, certainly, uh, doing arbitration work uh, within the community. Um, maybe if you could tell our listeners who may not be familiar with arbitration and mediation, how that works, and perhaps how you got involved in that. Um, I think that might be a good sort of segue, if there is any, into what we kind of want to talk about today. Sure. Uh, yeah, thank you for this. Uh I don't know that arbitration or mediation, either of those are the best word for this. I don't have a, a good word, but the, the short answer, the short explanation is that uh, over the past few years, I've been pulled into quite a few cases involving the misconduct of, of various people, some of whom are, are Muslim preachers, some of whom are professionals in other fields. And uh, at the very least, I've been called in to give input or to help give some semblance of, of authority or community backing. Uh, in the case of Muslim preachers, um, including a very recent prominent one, I've been involved with, I believe, give or take about 11 cases, um, two of which were very, very prominent, uh, but most of which were local, not limited to Chicago. So, and so, so a lot of what I'd been doing was giving advice on, on how to what are the questions that need to be asked both in terms of the, the accus accusations, how to approach accusations, and then uh, what are the concerns, like for example, the preservation of the dignity of everyone involved, the preservation of the Iman, of, of the followers, uh, the safety of the community, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not a professional in this in any capacity and I don't claim to be. Uh, it's more just because of increasing experience. Right, so I, I guess, you know, one case kind of led to another, led to another, led to another kind of thing, right? 
Yeah, I mean, even uh, the first case, uh, the first prominent case was not my very first case uh, working on. Um, um, but because of the size of, of, of the, the events, um, naturally, that, uh, that brought me into the-, the Quite a few people, topic. right? So, I mean, I, I don't want to, uh, I, I don't want to, well, this is not really the lead, but I mean, you know, what we are alluding to, and I don't, I want, I'd rather stop alluding to it, um, is the uh, Abdullah Salim case in Elgin that I imagine a lot of our listeners, certainly those in Chicago, uh, and I think even beyond uh, are familiar with that case, the specifics of that case, uh, or probably not the specifics, but certainly have heard of it. Um, I think that's the case you are referring to, correct? Um, so, well, and, and to be honest, I, I don't know how well known this is outside of Chicago and even there. Uh, a fairly narrow subset of people in Chicago. I mean, maybe we can give some background. Yeah, no, no, I, I was going to certainly ask Omer to do that, uh, as comfortable as he is. And I, I mean, I imagine some of it is probably still ongoing in terms of the the investigation. So I don't know what you can comment on, but please do. Yeah, still like some like Zucky said, taking place, so I'll be limited in the things that I can say. But uh, the the short public version of the story was that uh, initially uh, there was an employee uh, of, of the Institute of Islamic Education who, who had accused Abdullah Salim of, um, of some very serious sexual misbehaviors with her. And, and she had spoken to uh, a number of people who then were connected to a number of students of mine who then told me. And uh, when something like that happens, you can't just, you know, say, yeah, this is not my, my cup of tea. You're going to have to talk to someone else. You have to figure out how to bring healing, uh, how to bring attention, how to bring justice. And uh, eventually he pleaded guilty um, uh, of the charges against him. In that process, we also discovered uh, quite a few other victims over the course of the past few, few decades. And also working on the case, uh, something that people kept saying in the community was, yeah, we've been hearing about this for 10 years. Yeah, we've been hearing about this for 20 years. Uh, but it seemed that no one came forward. So. Yeah, you know, I mean, obviously, it, wow. it, I, I think we, again, Saki, I mean, this, it, you know, both of you guys, I, I think especially are, you know, people who are, who, who you know, who comment on what's going on in, in films and movies and in Hollywood. And certainly I think, you know, we, we giving listeners a context of kind of the fact that we are recording while this sort of Harvey Weinstein case sort of un, 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 unfolds uh, among many others. It seems like almost every day goes by, right? That there's not someone. Be yeah, this, I mean, this is a conversation Omer and I were having off mic before we started where it feels like all of a sudden these stories are not just coming out, because as Omar said, I mean, there's always been whispers, whether we're talking about the situation with, with Abdullah Salim in, in that uh, field or, you know, Harvey Weinstein in this field. You know, there's always been whispers, but suddenly we're at a point where these things are coming out and people are saying, yes, I believe you. And yes, this is wrong. And that does feel like a turning point of sorts. I mean, it's <clears throat> it's very difficult for for survivors and victims to come forward because right from the start, that requires them to, to continue living in the trauma that they experienced, right? So that's the first problem. Second problem hmm. is more often than not, the more prominent the the accused or the perpetrator is, the harder it is to get people to to believe you. Um, and very often, what you find in these cases, whether we speak of Harvey Weinstein or or whomever else. Uh, there is a predatory behavior where they are identifying people that they can take advantage of in terms of life status, personal story, etc., uh, which means that the person does not even know that they have resources that they can turn to for help, right? And then the second all hmm. of this starts going public, then it's just a feeding frenzy where everyone becomes an investigator. And usually they focus more on the innocent or the guilt of, of the accused rather than the care and healing of, uh, of the accuser, the survivor, the, the victim. So for example, there's another prominent case where a prominent Muslim has been accused of rape and much of the online discussion, I mean, I'm not paying too much attention to it because I already have enough uh, uh, on my plate, but a lot of the discussion- Enough darkness. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah <laughs> more than enough darkness. But um, the, the point being that a lot of the discussion is, okay, can he possibly do it? Or what kind of agenda is there against him? But mm -hmm. one way to frame it is that, all right, you want 
the person, the accused, to be innocent. So then you can hopefully go with the attitude that a rape has not been committed. A woman has not been raped. That's one point. But then on the other hand, uh, very rarely do women come forward. And, and so even if a mm. woman is coming forward, uh, this has to be taken very, very seriously. But then the third point is um, I'm not part of the investigation. As a regular person, uh, I'm not part of the investigation, so there isn't much to gain by me providing, you know, speculation. And a lot of a lot can be lost by way of uh, providing speculation. So you let the people who are involved go through their process. Yeah, I mean, I think in the in the particular case that you're referencing, which just literally broke, you know, what 48 hours ago in terms of the accusation, um, it looks like it's going through the you know, uh, French legal system, right? I mean, there's been a, a, a complaint filed. Um, the, the accused is now responding, saying that he is innocent of those charges and will be filing a counterclaim or a, a, a lawsuit of for, for uh, you know, libel or, you know, right? So, 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 I mean, it looks like it's going to play out in the court system. As opposed to, I think, some of the cases that, um, I, I think that, well, I, again, I don't want to bury the lead here. So, I mean, you were involved in two very prominent cases that have uh, certainly become a topic of discussion. One dates back a few years, which is the Abdullah Salim case that we're talking about, or we have been talking about. And then more recently um, is, of course, the, 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 the case of Noman Ali Khan, um, you know, the uh, prominent Muslim preacher online uh, personality uh, and uh, based out of Dallas, Texas and uh, Malaysia, I believe. So anyway, so the, the, so so with with those, I think it was slightly different, right? There wasn't there wasn't a pending litigation at the time, at least of your involvement. Mm -hmm. Meaning, if if uh, there's the impression that a crime has been committed from an, uh, a state or an American legal sense, in many ways those issues are much easier to handle because then you push to get the police involved. Okay. And, and then, you know, much of the, the groundwork or the legwork is out of my hands. If it's a matter of Islamic law being violated, then things get a little bit more complicated because you have to figure out how to address it. And a point I made in a different interview is that what people are perceiving to be an effort towards justice is not usually an effort towards justice, right? If someone mm -hmm. has violated Islamic law, but as far as we know, has not violated uh, civil law, then it's often not a quest for justice as much as it is a quest for, for healing and safety. Mm. I think you're outing someone because of, of the risk that they pose to others as well as to themselves, right? That hadith that you should help your brother, I'm paraphrasing, you should help your brother, uh, whether oppressed or an oppressor, and we understand how to, how to help an oppressed, but how do you help an oppressor? You, you help them not to oppress or you make it hard for them to oppress. Correct. Correct. Yeah. Um, so uh, it, there's, again, there's so much to talk about. I mean, I, I think then rather than keep going back and talking about the Abdullah Salim case, and, and, I, and, I, and we'll come back to it because I think I do want to juxtapose that case with the particular case that I do want to talk to you about. And that's, of course, the, uh, again, the Noman Ali Khan case. So, and, and this is certainly more uh, recent. And so if you could maybe kind of, again, walk the listeners through um, your involvement in the case. Uh, was it similar to the Abdullah Salim case in that someone approached you uh, who was a, a, a alleged victim? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, again, couple... given whatever you can talk about, right? I mean, I, I, yeah. I think that should be a general caveat for the show. So let's just kind of dispel with that. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, uh, I don't really have any any. I'm on the show uh, because you guys, as as my my colleagues and friends, asked me to be on the show. I have no interest in any sort of self promotion, and as you can see from social media, uh, all I've gained, the vast majority of what I've gained, is hate, which is to be expected, right? And so yeah, yeah. yeah. And again, we we can also talk about that. Too, I would love but, to, uh, please. Yeah, we will. Yeah. So. Uh, so Noman is a person that I've known for a couple of decades through our involvement in this, this organization that was around back then called Tanzima Islami. It was part of the Khilafah movement. Noman was this, this young kid from, from New York. I was this guy from, from Chicago, and we used to cross paths quite a bit through, through work in, in, in that organization. And, and so since then, both of us have, have more or less unofficially, at least if not officially, departed from, from that group. Uh, but we've been in touch uh, a couple times a year, right? Uh, and sometimes discussing matters that are 
very, very personal, seeking help in personal matters. And uh, uh, about two years ago, there was a lot of attention given to secret marriages among, among prominent Muslim preachers. And, and uh, Muhammad Fadl even uh, wrote an excellent article uh, about the illegality from an Islamic perspective of secret marriages. And, uh, and I was hearing rumors about Noman being involved in certain unethical behaviors. And, and so I contacted a mutual friend of mine, a friend of ours, saying, here, here's some rumors about, about Noman. What do you think? And that friend uh, immediately flew down to Dallas to investigate himself. And he came back after a day or after a couple of days saying, there's nothing going on. And um, that you, meaning Omar, should be ashamed that you even considered any of these rumors. And I said, yeah, you're right. And so from that point for the next year or so, anytime I'd hear anything about rumors against Noman, I would shut them down completely saying, no, uh, nothing is true. Uh, someone close to me even checked everything out. None of these rumors are, are uh, have any basis. And then what happened at the beginning of the summer is that uh, I got contacted by that same friend saying that he found out from Noman that Noman was actually lying. And, and, and so there's this case going on down in Dallas uh, of these of these community scholars, all of whom are very prominent scholars on the national scene, um, and there's going to be a meeting, and things are are looking very very tense, and so the mutual friend told Noman that Muzaffar should go down to help uh, because I'm friends with Noman and I've experienced in these types of things, you know, sort of keeping the peace, especially in these types of matters. And then someone among those scholars also contacted me. And we're speaking about a span of, of probably less than 24 hours in between these different phone calls. Uh, uh, an, uh, one of those scholars contacted me saying that we have this case and it's pretty serious. And again, things are very, very tense and heated. Is there any way you can come down? And, and so I, I flew down a day or two later and, and got involved and sat with the scholars to to hear the whole narrative to go through to go through evidence and such and then I sat with Noman uh, and and listened to his his narrative and most of this is the stuff that I put in my original post on this and then and then had a meeting with with the scholars and and with Noman as well as someone uh, uh, helping Noman on, on his side and and then you know work to find out how to address this and again, all this is in the post uh, that Noman had agreed that he is not going to speak. Um, and then he's going to uh, go through a process of personal reform of the guidance of a therapist, as well as a spiritual guide. And a few other things like uh, the scholars would contact the, the people in the leaders um, in, in Dallas and elsewhere um, to inform them, but would not start blasting this publicly on social media or anything like that. But a letter would be kept to uh, to blast this all on on social media right. in but case the just to clarify happen. when you say Noman had agreed not to speak. I mean, we're talking about giving public lectures or uh, I guess recording new lectures, right? Because the way the Bayana structure of his organization is, they record him and then they post. Correct? Yeah, that's exactly it. He did uh, bring up the point that he has quite a few uh, lectures previously recorded. Uh, that he uh, he asked permission to post, and then I gave him permission to post them as long as they're not uh, related to gender, marriage, something like that. Can I also ask, um, uh, so by this time, by the time these accusations and this investigation was going on, um, his divorce, I mean, which at that time was already a very public divorce from his first wife, had already, had already, had already occurred? Um, because that's a uh, more matter related to his personal life, even though it crosses over into all this, uh, I'm going to suggest that we leave that off the table, uh, unless sure, it's sure, sure. possible for us to avoid it. Um, I mean, there are other, that's fine. That's fine. there are accus accusations regarding his divorce, accusations regarding, uh, finances in terms of his marriage, accusation regarding finances, uh, relate to Bayana. Uh, uh, when I went down and met with everyone, I said, this is, this is not of my concern in terms of why I'm coming down. Right. So as it right. is, there's, I'm, I'm limited what I'd be able to share anyway. To, to completely understand. Like completely. A, no, it makes sense. Personal, personal life. Yeah. 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 No, it makes sense. Um, I, I don't know if we're leaving anything else out in terms of timeline. I mean, I, I guess then that kind of leads to then what happened or what transpires then 
that that leads you to then publicly uh you know, make the statement that you did vis-a-vis -vis social media, uh, kind of sure. quote unquote, breaking the case. So there are multiple times where, where I was hearing rumors that he was posting again, or he was, uh, he was speaking again. First, there was a post on the Baina site, uh, under his name. And then I contacted, contacted him saying, you know, uh, tell me that this is not from you. Um, and he said, no, it's from the Baina people. So I asked them to change it to, instead of saying it's from Noman, but to say it's from the desk of Noman. But the Baina people, in terms of cooperating, I just removed the post entirely. It was, it was just a paragraph about something. Uh, but then as we got to, uh, into the fall, I started hearing quite a few rumors that he was speaking again. And, and uh, uh, whether it's uh, including khutbahs and talks, and again, looking for, for evidence, then I was given evidence, uh, very clear evidence of this. And, and I was getting ready to contact him, uh, in the same way I contacted him before and also deliberating on how to address this. Cause that means as far as I'm concerned, the deal's broken, unless there's a good explanation. And literally just about the time I was getting ready to contact him, all of us received letters from his attorney. Uh, one person received uh, a threat of a lawsuit. The others received uh, a demand or an offer, depending upon how you want to read it, uh, uh, for further mediation because allegedly there were a lot of lies told in, in the previous meeting. And, and so now that it, le lawyers were involved, uh, um, that uh, I didn't know whether I could or should contact him directly anymore. And so that led to another week of, of deliberation. And, and in the process over that next week, uh, I found out that there's a person, um, um, uh, for whom he owes an immense amount of salary, uh, because of a, a month long class in the summer and he was refusing to pay that person. And, and, and so things started getting even worse and worse. And the then in the process of writing this letter, which uh, was a variation of the original letter that we had first that I had first mentioned, and and this letter over the course of the summer went through as many as thirty drafts, um, you know, just uh, changing words here and there, adding paragraphs, removing paragraphs, uh, with multiple people reading, and I was getting advice from multiple people directly involved with the case or not immediately involved with the case, you know, people whose opinions I respected and received a, a whole spectrum of, of opinions leading to what eventually became after a whole series of istikharas hitting send or post and posting the, the letter. Posting the letter that you posted on, on I think it was Facebook, correct? Yeah. 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 I and mean, one of the questions was also, how do we make sure to make it authentic? Because uh, I could, uh, in, the, uh, in the Salim case, I posted publicly on my blog um, do we go to the media? I already had a media strategy ready if necessary, um, because of multiple different contacts in the media, or do we go through uh, a different approach? And the only way that I felt I could have, I could express authenticity that this is an actual statement, not from an imposter was to make it from my own social media account. Of course, one of the questions becomes why on social media and the answer is because it was going to go on social media within a few minutes of no matter what method would be used to go public, whether Correct. it's a major, a major news and news site or, or a blog within literally minutes, it would be going on social media. Did you, did you feel some hesitation of, I mean, having gone through the gauntlet already with the Abdullah Salim story? I mean, I, I saw how you were taking fire from all sides. Were you a little bit like, can somebody else take point on this so that I don't have to go through this I mean, again? Uh, I wasn't worried about the hate for a couple reasons. Uh, the biggest reason was my real concern far more than any hate was, am I doing something wrong? Mm -hmm. Right. Is this the right thing? Is this the wrong thing? Cause something like this, when you have a community problem, you almost never have a good choice to make. It's always four, five, seven horribly bad choices. And then you have to figure out which is the, the least the, bad, the best, yeah, the best, the least worst of those bad choices, meaning every choice will have some benefit, but it's going to have all kinds of, of known consequences and then unknown consequences. Right. And so my biggest concern was, you know, yeah, Allah Ta'ala, am I doing something wrong here? Am I doing this right? Right. And this is literally just prayer after prayer after prayer. And then in hindsight, what in every single case that I've worked on, uh, it's okay. Did I make the right choices? Are these the right choices or not? And constantly seeking forgiveness for anything that I'm not seeing. Um, 
And so that's one reason why I wasn't really too, really too worried about the hate. The other, because I just had bigger worries. Another reason was because uh, I'm doing this for the community and I know my community, I love my community. And with, with the deepest that I can express, I've dedicated myself in service to a love for my community. And so I know exactly how the community is going to react and they reacted exactly as I expected. And so I see the community as my younger brothers and sisters, if not my children. And, and you know, I, I knew that uh, this would not be taken well. If I had a better way to go through every step, um, uh, I would have gone through those. So. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, all the different times I was cursed to hell, all the different times I received death threats, um, even, yeah. um, just insults. Uh, some, some of the, the, the comments were just sheer trolling, but other people, I think, were expressing the actual pain and anger in their hearts, especially because they don't know me from anybody else. And that's, that's part of the work of community. Anyone who's been involved deep down at the, at the ground level of community work already knows this, that you make a choice and a lot of people are going to be unhappy, especially because they're not going to be able to appreciate the complexity of every single issue. Yeah, that's right. And, and I think I, no, I, I appreciate you saying that, um, you know, very much so. And I think certainly people who are out there listening who have been involved, like you said, from the, you know, in, in, in any capacity in community work um, kind of can not only relate, but share that pain in, in a lot of instances. Um, if I could, you know, I, I want to turn a little bit to the conversations that have now that, that, that are taking place. Uh, whether it's social media or whether it's even in more, say, academic circles or where, wherever may be the case, um, I, I think that – well, there's a, there's a few things. I think there's some terminology that is used that I would love for you to sort of comment on and, and, and kind of offer your insight into the terminology. Um, and, and one of those terms that often gets used here is um, – there's a few, and I, I want to get into each and every one of them, but one of them is spiritual abuse, right? That oftentimes yeah. the accusation here is that the perpetrator or, or the accused has, you know, has, has, has engaged in spiritual abuse. So if you could maybe kind of talk about what that means and, and, and whether that's, you know, and, and, and obviously in these two instances, we're not probably not in these, in both of these instances, but so let, let's say in the, in the Abdullah Salim case where, was that like a prelude or a precursor to sexual abuse that then took place? Um, and if you could. Okay. Um, so, uh, so there's a couple questions there uh, regarding the, the, the latter point uh, in terms of, of the Abdul Salim case. Uh, there it was really understood to be a matter of, of, of the law being broken. So yeah. um, at the very least, it's an employer violating the rights of, or rights of an employee. And then when you get into the, the, who the employer, the employer was and the employee was, then we would also perhaps categorize this as spiritual abuse. Why? Uh, just because that the person who is the perpetrator or the accused perpetrator is respected as being of some degree of prominence in the community because of what is perceived to be a very high level of faith, a very closeness in the relationship with Allah Ta'ala as well as their Islamic knowledge. And, and the victim is someone, uh, almost always a woman, and he is almost always a man. The victim is almost always a, a, a woman. And, and she is being placed in a position where it is very hard for her to say no because of the power of or the influence of the speaker. Uh, now, to be fair, uh, some people raise the point that, okay, some, some women are going in, you know, fully, uh, fully knowledgeable and consenting of what, we're of what they're doing. We can address that also. But the first thing to understand is that this is not a power balance, especially because you will find in the transcripts and the text messages very often the, the, the woman, the student, uh, you want to call her the fan, the fan, or whatever term you want to use, uh, she's asking the, the preacher, is this okay? Islamically, right? And the preacher is saying, yes, it is, or don't worry about mm -hmm. it. Uh, there's more, uh, there are others, uh, other experts who are much better at talking about this, like um, Sheikh Rami Insur, uh, who, uh, who's part of In Sheikh's Clothing, and one of the signatories of the other statement regarding Noman, uh, and I always mispronounce her name. Um, uh, it's not Aishal Adawiya, it is Asma Abu. I, I, I hope she'll forgive me. I'm totally mispronouncing her name, but you can find her name on, on 
that site, and she has a couple of writings about this as well. But that's what it is in a simple nutshell. Is this the uh, In Shakes Clothing, the person who started that site, you mean? So In Shakes Clothing is, uh, I want to say it's Danish Gossam, Rami and Sur, and then Dania Shukfe. And Dania then, Shukfe, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, I'm sorry, Shukfe. And then, let's see, it's, this is how bad I am with people's names. And then, uh, and then there was a statement by, by uh, Imam Majid, Dr. Matson, and, and a few others uh, regarding the Noman case. And she's one of the signatories on that. And um, in the moment, uh, I'm at a loss on, on how to pronounce her name. But no, you can no, see no. her name there. Right, right. Zainab Ansari also, uh, Sheikha or Staza Zainab Ansari has also had an article from quite a few years ago on Muslim Matters uh -huh. talking about all of this. But in a nutshell, what are we talking about? We're saying that it's not simply the case of a man going to a woman and propositioning her and she's saying yes. Uh, I think everyone would understand that if you're at work and your employer is propositioning is propositioning you, that it's not uh, the same thing. And then if it's someone who is revered as an authority on Islam, uh, it's also not the same thing as two people, you know, meeting at a bar or at a at a conference and then and then connecting. Okay. Yeah. And, and I think this is probably as good as a time as any, uh, you know, yeah. which is, you know, again, one of the things I did want to do, because again, I think a lot of this gets murky or a lot of this gets um, conflated, especially in online discussions that I've seen or that even in private and, and somewhat less than private conversations about these matters is where the case, like, for example, you have the case of Abdullah Salim on, the, on one hand, and then you have the case of Noman Ali Khan on the other hand. And the conflation that I often see occurring is that, and again, this is probably, well, this leads me to asking about the next term, which is predatory behavior, uh, is that the reason why both of these ca cases often get conflated is, well, here's just another example of, quote unquote, predatory, pr predatory behavior. So maybe talk a little bit about predatory behavior and, and how you define that and, and why it's important, or maybe you don't feel it's important, to draw a distinction between the case of Abdullah Salim, which is a case of sexual misconduct, mm -hmm. and the case of Noman Ali Khan, which is a separate matter. So, uh, in terms or is of, it? I'm not. You well, know, I'm, I'm, I don't want to lead the question. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a, a number of questions built into that. So first, when we're talking about predatory behavior, uh, continuing with the notion that there's a power dynamic here. Uh, uh, where the person who is pursuing is is of of uh, you know a very high stature in whatever capacity, often community community perception, and the person being pursued is often someone who is uh, often unknown and often someone who the community will wrongly just discard because because she doesn't fit certain certain molds, and it becomes predatory when it's repeated behavior. Mm. Uh, uh, of the of the same type of patterns, as though you know there's there's a predator and there's prey, right? right? The the case I mentioned, you know, all these cases that I worked on. Some of those cases it was a one off thing, but I'll give you a different example of a very different case that I mean that was local, not even in Chicago, of of a man who who was an imam of his particular mosque, and he would. He would meet women who are middle-aged and somewhat wealthy, and he would marry them and collect a certain amount of their wealth, and then he would divorce them to marry another woman and divorce her to marry another woman and divorce her to marry another woman. And these were often women that had some amount of wealth. They were abuse victims. Uh, they were divorcees. And looking from the outside in, I think it's very easy to say that there's some sort of abuse going on. He's taking advantage of either their esteem for him or things that they don't know. And and then he is doing whatever he needs to or wants to and drops them. In mm -hmm. Islamic law, I mean, there's this principle that's often taught, uh, you know, Sadr al-Zarahi, mm -hmm. that, um, you know, blocking these these paths uh, where, like, if you have a young man who's marrying a, a wealthy woman, then he may be ineligible to collect her inheritance because it's possible that he might just be marrying her to, to collect inheritance. That's right. And so, so the point is that these, these issues we do find in our, our, our history as issues that have been legally addressed. And again, uh, Muhammad Fadl's article talks in tremendous detail about this. And if I remember correctly, he had an even longer version that has not yet been published. Correct. Uh, uh, regarding Noman and Abdullah Salim, uh, I don't, I mean, I look at every single case as uh, unique on its own. I have not had the, the situation where you have 
all kinds of different uh, crimes performed uh, from within the same institution. In the Abdullah Salim case, uh, there are actually two perpetrators accused. Um, uh, one on one case, and the Abdullah Salim was on these other multiple cases. Um, but uh, that would be the case where you know you might address uh, all like if you have multiple predators in the same institution, if you have multiple perpetrators or accused perpetrators in the same institution, then you might treat them all the same way. But all the cases I've looked at, I've been involved with, I've treated in completely unique ways mm. according to whatever the specifics of those moments. So. A, a, a quick note uh, that I that I want to also uh, invite you to comment on is um, uh, you, because you mentioned institutions. So you've got uh, the institution um, that is run or was run by Abdullah Salim, uh, IIE, I think, right? And then you have yeah. Bayana. Now, the, I, to my understanding, the, like the difference between the two is one is a for-profit, right? Bayana is a for-profit entity, and uh, IIE, I would imagine, is not is, is a non-profit entity. Yeah, I mean, those those would be different, uh, both in terms of tax codes as sure. well as what is understood in terms sure. of the methods used for for generating income and such. But yeah, the bottom line is one is Which is why I raised the point, because I mean, as someone who's been involved with a nonprofit, you know, for the last few years, you know, I mean, you know, yeah. w w when you have issues of either accusations or whatever may be the case uh, against leadership, I mean, you know, there's then the ethical responsibility or a fiduciary responsibility that you have as a nonprofit to your donors, to those who, the, your benefactors, um, you know, versus in a for-profit entity, I think it, it becomes a little, I'm not saying that there aren't any ethical responsibilities there, but, you know, there is, uh, there is that additional layer is, I guess, what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, some of those things uh, would be beyond uh, my. Oh, no, no. I know. I know. I just, yeah. I, I think it, 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 again, this is something that I think of as, again, someone who's, who's straddled, who has been on both sides of the fence in the sense that I've worked for for profit entities and I've worked for non profit entities in a legal capacity. And I can, you know, I, I, to me, there's. Uh, there's certainly legal uh, implications involved, and there's also ethical implications involved, which is perhaps here as good as any of a point to make, which is that oftentimes, again, we conflate, the, uh, we conflate ethics and ethical violations with legal and le legality and legal yeah. violations. Um, how, would you, how would you, as, a, as an expert? I'm no uh, expert, uh, Omer, but I... <laughs> What's the difference between, uh, in terms of how you're defining something that's uh, an ethical violation sure. versus a legal so violation? It, it, well, I appreciate you asking. And, and so, I, and, and, I, and I, perhaps the best analogy I can give is one that I use when I teach um, the difference in Islamic law terms, okay? And, and, and I invite you as a scholar of the Quran to, to comment on this because my, the analogy that I give is often from the Quran or, or by virtue of sort of arguing from the perspective of, let's take the Quran... Uh, and and it's, it's ethos. And so, you know, so legally speaking, for example, um, the, if someone were to wrong you or were to strike you, let's say even physically, right? Um, Islamic law and by, and by, you know, by not by extension, but um, the Quran, let's say, allows you, permits you legally to take back, you know, to, to, to right the wrong by striking the person back, right? Uh, I mean, if, if, if uh, there's adjudication and everything. Correct. Assuming that has taken place. Not random. Of course, of course, yeah. of course. Assuming that has taken place. However, uh, the, the ethical or the, 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 the Quran also calls you for uh, an ethical standard, which is to show clemency, to forgive, right? Mm -hmm. You aren't legally obligated to forgive or to show clemency um, uh, because it's, you know, it's, you know, right for a right, the, uh, you know, wrong for a wrong. But, but as far as you know, uh, the, the ethical uh, calling um, of the Quran would be to forgive and to show clemency. Uh, and so that's kind of the distinction between, or, or that I make between legality and ethics, right? Just because something is, 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 is legally permissible or is, 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 doesn't violate the law doesn't mean that it's the most ethical thing to do. Sure, right. I mean, this is, 
I mean, uh, without going too far off topic, I mean, the issue you always have with law is that there are ways to figure out loopholes um, to, to violate the law. And this is where we get into the letter of the law, Correct. the spirit of the law. So, so the closest analogy to that in our tradition would be the uh, the usul and the maqasid, right? The usul would be focused on the on the text, uh, the interpretation of of you know the individual eyes in hadith. Are they categorical? Are they ambiguous? And then the maqasid would be looking at, okay, what are the, the, the higher priorities that we are seeking to, mm -hmm. to fulfill? And 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 so the goal is that to, to to have something to have Islamic integrity uh, means that you're fulfilling you know these 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 big questions and the other big question becomes um, that all right what level of authority do you have if you're in a secular state and and that's why I keep emphasizing on these conversations that justice is is not what is being sought in terms of what I'm doing it's Figuring out what is uh, the best way to to bring safety and healing when it is uh, appropriate, and sometimes that means outing people uh, at various levels or various okay. platforms. You know, you've also reminded me. This conversation has also reminded me that I don't want to give the impression that I'm coming in like like some superhero in all these cases. Uh, I'm frequently uh, calling upon uh, expert professionals in whatever appropriate field. Is, is relevant um, to get their input, whether we're talking about attorneys, whether we're talking about experts in sexual violence, whether we're talking about psychiatrists, psychologists, etc. Uh, so I don't, I also don't want to make this seem like this is just like some one man show. I come along, you know, like, like, uh, you know, <laughs> no, 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 like, right. Like the movie character. No, I think it's, I think that's important to make because oftentimes you become the sort of, you, you like, you're the person on the front lines taking the, the sort of hits, but you have, you know, your own, sort of support group of people that you have 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 included and, and brought on with regards to any you know any particular case that you're working on um, and I, I would I think I, I don't know if you mentioned this specifically but in addition to professionals you know a group of scholars right I mean some Muslim Islamic scholars who you turn to for yeah. advice. I, I appreciated that you that you called me a scholar but officially uh, I cannot claim to, to be a scholar uh, but in, in the Noman case, uh, the, the original crew was a number of scholars across different Islamic outlooks. I mean, we had one that we would identify as a Salafi, one we would identify as, as a Deobandi, or you might say two Deobandis, two Salafis. Even those or, lines get blurred, whatever right? that's worth. Yeah. And, and the point is that... <laughs> yeah, Even those so lines get blurred, my friend. Uh, yeah. But, but uh, yeah, so... so uh, yeah, so this yeah. type of work, especially because how serious it is, it's not something that can be done haphazardly right. by somebody who's well-intentioned. I mean, uh, all I bring to the table is community experience and then experience in uh, these type of cases. And if there's any sort of expertise, yeah. it's knowing how to right. navigate Which is... the community. Basically. A science, if not an art, you know, I don't know, which, which, whichever one. Yeah, it's, it certainly takes practice and experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and sometimes, I mean, why do I become the face? Because this allows everyone to fire their hits at me, which means that other people who are behind the scenes can, can be protected, especially the, the survivors. That if everyone's focused on me, you know, firing accusations at me at such, then the survivors can remain in. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I want to go back to something you, you brought up at the outset, and I think that maybe, and this is probably more relevant in the instance of the Noman Ali Khan case, which is you're, you drawing distinction between um, where a crime has been committed, i.e. a violation of criminal or civil law or statute, right, uh, versus a violation yeah. occurring, uh, a violation of Islamic law occurring, Okay. So let's just take, I mean, and, and this, like I said, perhaps relates to the Noman Ali Khan case, and we don't have to necessarily go into specifics, but in the case of someone who is accused of um, uh, a polygamous, you know, in being involved in, you know, in, in polygamous uh, marriages, right? Secret or not, secret or otherwise, right? You have uh, a possibility that that person has violated uh, civil law. Right by engaging by, by 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 simply by virtue of the fact that they have engaged in bigamy or polygamy, um, how do you draw that distinction? Or how, how do you how do you so? But so there you have a violation of civil law, but you don't have a violation of Islamic law, at least as it is interpreted by the majority of Muslim scholars. Yeah. So uh, 
uh, in terms of something like polygamy, I'll say that of the cases that I've been pulled in off the top of my head, something as, for lack of a better way to describe it, straightforward as polygamy, as polygamy has not been the case. So in some cases, it's a person who is married to multiple women, but the first wife does not know, or the uh, uh, the uh, uh, the person who who to whom the the man is getting married to, um, she doesn't know that he's already married to someone else. Um, so usually it's not as simple as you know as someone married to more than one woman. Uh, the issue, in my understanding, of the problem with polygamy in American society, aside from whatever people feel about it personally, you are correct that the overwhelming majority uh, of, of scholars uh, do regard it as something that is Islamically allowed, is that the, the second, third, fourth wife has no rights. She's effectively a mistress or she's effectively a girlfriend. And, and so she only has those rights as a citizen of society, but she can't go to the courts to divorce her husband um, because she's not recognized as, as, uh, as his wife. And that becomes uh, something that I think people do need to consider. Um, those people, those women who are participating in, in a polygamous marriage, I mean, uh, going with the assumption that everyone's going with full sound mind, and even if the first wife knows uh, and, and supports it, what are, how can she ensure that her rights will be fulfilled, right? I mean, I, you know, I, regardless of you know the stance of the scholars I cannot see myself supporting my daughter as being a first second third fourth wife and and so I tend to sit out of that debate as as an Islamic principle or as an American social principle but the concern would be um, how do her rights get insured in a secular society okay so and so yeah and I think that's an important distinction because when you talk about rights I mean, you're talking about her rights in, again, in, in a secular society that doesn't recognize the fact that she is married to this individual. Yeah. Exactly. So health care, uh, you know, uh, inheritance uh, mm -hmm. and, and various other issues come into play. Uh, in the case of dissolution of marriage, what are her rights, mm -hmm. right? Because, again, if the marriage is not if the marriage is not recognized by the state, how then you know, it certainly wouldn't recognize a divorce proceeding, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, these are, I mean, uh, the Islamic legal questions, we do find a number of scholars who do wrestle with these yeah. to figure out answers. Uh, from an institutional perspective, however, uh, why, why does my role exist? It's because we have not yet formed a go-to or a series of go-to institutions for people to go to if they've, if they've been abused or if they feel they've been abused. You know, I've been trying to put together, you know, a team or a set of teams uh, that so that if an accusation comes forth um, from a victim or on behalf of a victim against uh, against a preacher, then rather than go to me, who's basically this Muslim chaplain at this university, um, but they can go to this office within the community that has all the expertise right there and the funding and they can go through mm -hmm. and investigate. That becomes, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the real actual practical question. Yeah. You know, how do these things get addressed uh, on a regular basis? I mean, even one of the difficulties I have had in forming these types of institutions is that, um, you know, this person of this ideological outlook, usually on the political left or left of center, does not want to work with that person who is on the political or religious or interpretive right. Um, and that's been one of the hard things is to get people to sign on to agree to work with each other. Um, and you have to have people uh, across uh, the, the spectrum of outlooks to address these things. I mean, this this all the, the reason I've even trying to form these groups is because uh, a teacher who helped me quite a bit on, on one of these big previous cases said, you know, to, to form a group like this. And that was a couple of years ago. And I'd been struggling to bring people who, uh, from all across the spectrum who, who are willing to work together and then, you know, just take over over these cases. It's, it's a hard thing to do. Can can you elaborate on some of the challenges that you're facing as far as that 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 notion of people's you know where they lie on on a, a socio political spectrum uh, bumping up against you know these sort of religious ideas that are maybe more nebulous and, and sort yeah. of the 
the challenges that well, present. I, I have to uh, clarify my language. When I'm saying to the political left, I'm, I'm actually meaning, I don't want to say the interpretive liberal uh, in, uh, in Islamic interpretation, because a lot of these people don't do any interpretation in the first place. It's basically hmm. uh, people that generally would be categorized as being to the left and people who would generally be categorized as being to the right, people who would generally be uh, categorized as being liberal. S separate from religion. I'm including religion, right? Yeah. Oh, okay, gotcha. So, so people who would be looked at in terms of their opinions as being liberal on, in terms of their Islamic opinions, and those people who would be looked at in terms of their opinions as being conservative. Uh, I don't even know of a good way to describe it because it's not like uh, I'm speaking of people who are more strict and more loose in their interpretation of text. Um, it's the way it seems to play out is those people who, who get categorized as looking at, uh, looking through the lens of academia and then mm -hmm. those people who get categorized as looking through the lens of, of Islamic traditions. Um, the first group often gets, uh, placed on the left and the second group often gets placed on the right. But the point I'm making is that a lot of times a person is judging someone else saying, I can't work with that person because they're closed minded. Okay. I can't work with that person because I don't agree with their opinions. And community doesn't work that way. Community work requires everyone for the sake of the community getting on the table and figuring out how to work together. And so, uh, you know, the people who've been working in the community for a long time, they understand this because people who don't understand this, they usually get burnt out and uh, angry and they wither away. Uh, and you have to figure out ways to bring everybody to the table um, for the sake of their own hereafter, for the sake of the hereafter of the people they're serving, for the paper, for the sake of the, the dunya of the people they're serving. And, and that alone, uh, if people don't understand that, it's hard to bring people together to work on these very serious issues with the end result being that, okay, somebody from some random city calls me up and says, okay, we got this issue, what do we do? Because they have no other place to go to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the like, yeah, it's interesting that you see you, you bring you bring that up because oftentimes you know the the association with closed mindedness is is from those quote unquote on the right or conservative yeah. mindset, whereas what you're saying and I've and I've and I've heard you say this in other interviews and contexts where you find oftentimes where that closed minded kind of approach uh, is is equally present, if not more so, from those who are quote unquote liberal or uh, I think that's in my experience also from the left being present in academia for a good 50 hours a week, <laughs> uh, the uh, uh, closed mindedness is right now far more often with the people who are left of center. Um, there are people who are very wide open in both yeah. sides. In the art industry, uh, which you know Zaki and I have, have uh, a bit of experience with, uh, there you find uh, people who are wide open um, on, on the left. But uh, on these types of matters, it seems that the people who are more willing to listen are people. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I've been wrestling with terminology. Some would say the activist left. Maybe that's what it is. Uh, I haven't been able to, to narrow it down. It may be like three or four groups that are all right. in that same cloud. I don't know yet. So. Yeah, you know, I mean, Zaki, this reminds me of a conversation, you know, when we had Wajahathon, right? And he kind of, of uh, touched on this. The, the uh, activist you left, know, in terms I guess of, you would call uh, it. The kind of intolerance uh, that people on the, uh, you know, on the left, uh, you know, assign to people who are fellow allies, uh, you know, in terms of progressive values or progressive reform. But, hey, I don't share your entire platform, but am I still welcome just because I don't share a particular nuance of your platform? You know, it reminds me also in this context of like what Dr. Jackson in the past in previous articles, Sherman Jackson, calls sort of designer fundamentalism, you know, and, and he, I don't know if you've read his piece, but yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting one. Yeah, I mean, Facebook, social media is like you're in a cafeteria, right? You're going to hear all these people at different tables just chattering away. Um, and, uh, it's not mm. serious deliberation. It's, you know, here's what I have to say about such and such. And here's what I have to say. And I think sometimes it succeeds more in alienating people than bringing people close together. Cause all you have to do is hit unfriend and somehow they're outside of your world. But yeah. Well, and, and, you know, I mean, it reminds me of, and we may, we may have mentioned this on the show earlier, but like what Sheikh Hamza Yusuf went through earlier this year, um, or, uh, you know, the the storm he was sort of at the center of, let me phrase it that way, um, where it, it was this sort of all this talking past him going on. And it was, you know, some days you just want to stay off Muslim Facebook, you know, 
<laughs> right, right, right. Or, or or attack people from the uh, from you know. Uh, from behind a computer or in anonymity, you know, in some cases where you don't, you know, it's not even known who the person is uh, who's commenting or, or accusing you of such and such. Um, I, I want to kind of go back, and I know we, we, we were talking about a lot of things, but, I, you know, go, going back to the idea, uh, and this is where another kind of thorny issue that comes up, especially in cases like the Noman Ali Khan inst uh, case or in cases of so called secret polygamous relationships and so on, is the idea of consent, right? Where, look, <clears throat> even if you were to argue that one person, and again, in, in your experiences, and I think largely this plays out, where it's often the man who is, is uh, involved in these relationships uh, from a vantage point of authority, and, uh, um, and, and, and there's certainly not an equal platform in, in, with, with regards to between the man and the woman in, the, in these instances, um, in terms of the relationship. However... Even if that were to, even if that, even if we were to say, okay, fine, that is that, that's what we're looking at here in this particular instance. Uh, where then do you place the val? What value then do you place on the autonomy, the 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 consent of the female in agreeing to be a second or a third or a fourth wife? Sure. Okay. So, so uh, everyone has agency. Right. Assuming we have someone, you know, who's bala, who's Thank mature, you. and who they have, you know, sound mind and everything. Everyone has everyone has agency, uh, but that agency is taken away if they're not given full disclosure. That, that's great the point. First issue. So, you know, we let's say we have a, a hypothetical preacher who is approaching a hypothetical student, you know, for marriage, um, and he is not giving her the full picture of his status that is different than her not giving him the full picture of her status because again of the power dynamic but yeah it is entirely possible that she is not sharing his whole her whole story with him well what would be uh, her story in this hypothetical i'm curious so in the hypothetical let's say she's you know she's having a relationship with another guy okay right so uh, i mean i'll put it like this um uh, so another reason why it was difficult uh, to put together a community is that around the time that uh, Muhammad Fadl's article got published, uh, there were two married people who were also working on the whole project, and I'm sorry I have to share this, who were working on the whole project of investigating preachers and their secret marriages, and they started an ongoing affair with each other. She confessed to her husband, he confessed to his wife. Uh, she eventually recanted her, her, her confession and denies it. Uh, he confessed repeatedly. And both of them are having this relationship with each other. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And, and so uh, I don't <laughs> want to give the impression that this is something that only men do. It's just that men are doing this way more often in my anecdotal experience than, than women, far more often. And I mean, think about it. Our community doesn't give much credence to, to female teachers anyway, female preachers. How many female preachers can you name that, that are given the large stage like it's not such, right? And so it could just be because of that, that we just give more attention to the men. So so that's one, uh, one way to look at the issue of consent. Agency is always there, but it's taken away from the other person if full okay. disclosure is not given. And then the other issue related to the power dynamic is when there's a breakdown, how many people and who do you have on your side to support you and defend you, okay? So what is often the case is the preacher will have uh, colleagues, friends, coworkers that will defend and support the preacher, whereas the victim or the survivor will have no one or will have strangers. And, and so that's another aspect that's lost in terms of, of, of the, the, the power dynamic problem. That another reason why a, victor can't come, a, a victim can't come forward is because she has nobody she doesn't know where to go the preacher can call up this friend that friend another friend and say hey look here's what's going on and the preacher more often than not also has funds to to do such and such and so as you saw with with this the the recent high profile case with with noman how many thousands of people oh, who yeah. are just fans came forward to defend him right um and that's uh uh that indicates the the, uh, the the difference of power dynamic. How many people who know the victims have come forward um, because uh, you know they have the the strength uh, or or the wherewithal to to actually speak? Very 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 few. Yeah. 
and this is how it plays out in in uh, practice. Mm, mm, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, no, I think those are all interesting points, uh, or, or, or certainly valid points, and I think that need to be taken into account as, as well when we do talk about uh, not only the, the, the imbalance of the power dynamic in place, but also, uh, you know, with, with regards to consent, right? Um, yeah. but, but, and so I, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know really where to shift the conversation again, because there's still a couple of areas that I do want to talk about, uh, and maybe this is as good, good, good as place as any. But I think that one of the uh, uh, one of the uh, dangers that I see um, is, or not dangerous, but one of the perhaps um, I don't know. Just, just, just I, th I think that what what we as a community need to be watchful of or mindful of is that when these accusations come out, um, that one, you know, obviously the validity of these accusations, right? And then in the context, or or or, or in situations where you have a preacher or a personality that is associated with a organization that the entire organization is not then impugned because of the behavior of one of its uh, of its uh, speakers or personalities does that make sense mm -hmm. yeah this is this gets um hard at this era of age in the muslim community because uh except for a few of the old, older organizations like ICNA, ISNA, uh, in most cases, the, the main figure is made synonymous with the institution. So even though Zaytuna is however many people on its staff, I mean, Zaytuna is looked at as synonymous with Hamza Yusuf, right? Yeah. Uh, Baina is looked at as synonymous with Noman, um, you know, or even think of Tatlif. Uh, it's looked at as being synonymous with, with Osama, with uh, Osama Cannon, and may Allah give him, give him cure, inshallah, and give his family uh, the, the strength to persevere through through his illness. I mean, and so, I mean, so so for a lot of institutions, it's hard to make the difference. Uh, a point that I made in my conversations with Noman is that I have no interest here in destroying Bayana, right? Mm, uh, right. Uh, when I was working uh, very closely on the IIE case, uh, I was very very vocal in saying, uh, both in terms of the people I was working with, as well as in other conversations, that I have no vested interest in destroying IIE. If anything, mm -hmm. you know, perhaps it could be like, you know, some rebranding or something like that in restructuring, <laughs> but that is outside of my purview to, to destroy it. And if there is an organization that is providing good, how, what adjustments can we make so that it continues to provide to do good? And on that IAE case, it's unfortunate that I have to say this, that, you know, I mentioned that you, when you'll have colleagues and, and, and fans or minions that will go after a victim or will go after the, the person who speaks openly. Um, you know, in the IAE case, there's some people who, who are official Islamic scholars who've been going after me for like two years. And it's almost as though they started jumping for joy uh, with the Noman case. And these are people that are super conservative Deobandis that would never in any other case support Noman because of his approach to Quran and, and, and Sunnah and Hadith and such. And they're, they're speaking, you know, siding with him completely. I mean, that's how, that's how ridiculous some of the stuff gets. And so... Yeah. The question that, that I don't have an answer to, and this is something that, that uh, Zucky and I were discussing just before the interview, is does this mean that you throw away all of their knowledge, right? So, so in the case of Abdullah Salim, who has you know 30 plus years of teaching in the Chicago community um, and then pleads guilty to these crimes, is actually accused of many more crimes, does that throw away all of his knowledge? And in Noman's case, does this throw away all of his knowledge or the other cases? And I don't have an answer to that yet. It's just like with uh, an artist, whether we're talking about uh, Roman Polanski or Woody Allen or Harvey Weinstein, right. does that mean you throw away all of the work that they've done? I don't have an answer yet, but I do know that it mm -hmm. does come to mind. And, and I mean, also like in our Dean, character is synonymous with knowledge, right? I mean, uh, in school, you'll read Einstein, you're going to read Freud, and you're not going to get into the fact that in terms of how they treated their families, they were horrible, horrible people, right? Um, and uh, because you're just focused, uh, you're disconnecting uh, practice, embodiment, and character from, from the knowledge that they're sharing. In our dean, you don't separate the two. So it becomes more difficult that if someone has a mm. uh, known bad character, whether it's lying or whatever other, like if it's big sins, then in terms of the narration, the hubbard that they're sharing, uh, it may be that you discard what they're sharing. You know? Sure. And so 
So in 2017, in terms of the knowledge that some of these people share, I don't have answers yet to these questions. These are things that I wrestle with very, very frequently. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, and I, and that brings me to something I do yeah. want to get into, but I, I want to come back to it because I think uh, – because you mentioned a lot of organizations and you mentioned, you know, them being synonymous with yeah. their uh, leading personality or scholar, right? You hope that, in, at least in the case of, and I don't know by in a structure, uh, I can certainly speak for Talib's structure, I mean, full disclosure, you know, someone who's involved with the organization. It, it, and, and let's just take not Talif as an example, but as a, as, as a particular model to study, right? Where, yeah, no doubt. You have an organization that is tied synonymously with its founder, i.e., um, uh, the 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 uh, the brand is associated, if you will, um, with a per a public personality. You hope that though that there is a there is a there is a governing body within that organization that is not so much in the business of protecting the name of its founder or the reputation of its founder yeah. uh, or the, do you know what I mean? Whereas their fiduciary duties and responsibilities are more for the, are more uh, uh, connected to the organization and not the personality. Now, I don't know, again, I don't know by a structure, if it's a for-profit entity, I would imagine though, it's in their best interest to be in the Noman Ali Khan defense business. Okay. But in the case of a nonprofit, certainly, I would hope that, you know, where that, that board or that body is not, the governing body is not in the business of defending. I mean, certainly if accusations are coming out that seem to be pretty valid, uh, are not simply in the business of defending its founder. Does that make it? Yeah, totally. I mean, I'll give you another example, again, not getting into specific names or organizations. There is one particular person who, who uh, married a woman. Uh, told everyone at the marriage to keep it a secret from his wife. Okay, like mm. this is actually, and I, and, and I had documentation that this is what happened. And and so uh, so the preacher and his his you know secret wife have their ongoing relationship, and he becomes very abusive with her, and he he, uh, uh, he also starts abandoning her. Right. Mm. She gets fed up with this. She reaches out to people to help. Most people aren't helping her. She reaches out to the the first wife, and this is this is going to make it uh, turn it into drama as a or not, I'm speaking drama from a from a film sense. Um, she reaches out to her first <laughs> wife and says, "I've been, you know, I've been a secret wife to your husband," and like she's outing herself to the first wife, and the first wife says, "Yeah, I was actually a second wife." And I outed myself to the first wife. She left. And you'd be surprised how common that conversation happens. But that's not the reason I'm making this story. Uh, that preacher was hired by a particular Islamic organization to be their teacher, their so-called scholar in residence. And first, there was this case with this, you know, secret, former secret wife that uh, what they started doing at, even though being a nonprofit organization, they started turning people in wow. their community against her. Yeah. Um, and then, and so essentially they're rallying behind or rallying around uh, their, their scholar. And then what does he do? This is a guy who I think just really could not physically control himself. He started doing the same thing with other women. <sighs> and, and so at some point, someone has to be able to look and say, uh, we might lose everything in dunya, but that might be what it takes for us to save our akhirah. I right. just want to, def again, we, I know there's probably only a handful of people out there in the audience who may not get these terms, but when we say dunya, we mean worldly affairs. When we say akhira, we mean, we mean you know, uh, afterlife. Yeah, yeah, correct, correct, correct. Sorry, go ahead. So, so yeah, I mean, that's the nature of, of life itself, that sometimes you have to choose between right and wrong, and that's the nature of when you're doing community work. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you are choosing between right and wrong at tremendous cost to your own self, right? We're taught to stand up for justice, even if it means going against your own self. And one way we often understand it is that if you're in the wrong, but also if it means you have to go against your own fear, your own laziness, uh, uh, et cetera. And, and so, uh, if a preacher is violating uh, the rights of, of a student, uh, they are playing with the iman of that student. I mean, in one of these cases, uh, there is a woman who is almost like she had almost, you know, let's say one foot and three toes outside of the dean, 
because she uh, was often just mistreated, had no place to go in terms of family and such. And a preacher, she approaches a preacher and then he starts helping her and it's helping, he's helping her grow his, her, her iman. And, and then he starts pursuing her. Uh, she doesn't know that he's married and he starts pursuing her towards marriage and, and they start talking marriage. And then she finds out that he's actually been married this whole time. And she said, it's because of people like you that I was leaving the Dean. Yeah. And Allah Ta'ala controls hearts, uh, but I fear ever hearing that I've knocked someone, or it was someone has left the deen because of, of my behavior. I mean, uh, it's, that's just terrible. Again, like leaving their re religious affiliation. Sorry. I mean, I, I, again. Yes. I, yeah. Sorry, thank you for clarifying. No, no, Dean. Yeah, we, we've used that term too. Uh, and we're not talking about Dean Martin or Dean anybody. Um, okay. So. <laughs> um, wow. I, I, I think, you know, uh, frankly, uh, now is probably the goodest time as any, you know, as we sort of maybe perhaps wrap up the discussion, uh, is to talk about what you think are some of the solutions to what I think are, is going to be an ongoing conversation in the community. Uh, and, and I mean, that's a huge question because, I mean, I think even to, when we even as we talk about solutions, again, we have to keep going back to what I or what we what we've talked about in the or what we've kind of tried to clarify during the during during, during this uh, course of the episode, which is to drawing distinctions between particular cases and 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 and, and the and the uh, you know uh, the specifics involved. So I, I guess mm -hmm. solutions. Uh, you know, I know at least a, a few months ago, or maybe this is a few a, a year now, over a year ago, when 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 Dr. Fadl's article came out, and when where the 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 topic du jour was sort of the idea, you know, secret marriages taking place and so on. I know that there was a proposed sort of co code of ethics, right? A standard, a, st a code of standard for uh, leadership, Muslim spiritual leadership within organizations. Um, I don't know if that ever really kind of took off. If there were people who signed off signed on to those, you know, to, 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 to those type of codes. But I think that that's a start. It's something that, you know, when we had Dr. Inger Matson on the show, she, 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 she certainly was part of that and talked about that. Um, do you know anything, if, if anything sort of happened from a governing point of view where we're asking organizations to sign off on this sort of code of ethics or code of, you know, code of conduct for its uh, employees? I know, I know that the conversation has taken place in some cities. The Council of Islamic Organizations did create uh, guidelines for, for institutions. Uh, I'm not sure how much it's been implemented by, by the various Muslim organizations in Chicago. I can't speak for the rest of the, the communities. Uh, there's a couple problems here. One, I mean, the problem is not even in coming up with the code of ethics. That's actually not yeah. very difficult. It's a matter of a number of people sitting at a table for, for at most That's a right. couple of hours. Right. Um, the implementation mm. is a challenge uh, because uh, most of our Muslim organizations have, you know, uh, the, the elections where someone is the authority for a year or a couple of years and then gets replaced by uh, another person, another board, gets replaced by another person, another board, and they're already doing something else full time. They might be full time engineers, doctors, business, lawyers, whatever. Lawyers. <laughs> anyway, so, so the point being that I'm, I'm, I'm just I know, I know. <laughs> but, um, but, um, and so it, it, when you already have a full-time life with work and family, uh, and then you basically have a little bit of extra time to give to your local Islamic organization. And every Islamic organization has zillions of issues, whether we're talking about just maintenance of the structure or dealing with politics or implementing programs, it's very hard to do anything that, sust that is sustained. And, and so I think one reason why we don't see this as a greater national conversation is that everyone's hands are already so full. You'll have, let's say, 20 people handling the, uh, the community affairs of 2,000 people. Of those 2,000 people, about 500 people will be critics about everything. You know, 1,500 people will be quiet and happy and grateful for whatever they get. And here you are in your board meetings trying to figure out, okay, what are your priority issues? And usually you're only going to be able to address the urgent matters. That's one issue. Uh, another issue to, to keep in mind is the celebrity preacher culture is never going to go away. I mean, yeah. as long as we have screens to look at, whether it's TV, film, or or you know uh, uh, YouTube, or and who knows whatever's going to come next. You know, whether it's these glasses or whatever comes after that, the celebrity culture is always going to be there. And so, 
uh, even if you were to, if all of the current Muslim celebrity preachers were to stop what they were doing, uh, they are going to very quickly be re replaced by other people who will start out as being well-intentioned. But I mean, I've, I've been involved, uh, as you guys know, you know, as, as, as Zucky has himself, you know, I've been involved with fame on the film and media side for, for the better part of a couple decades. And I've also, you know, I know so many of these public preachers, uh, fame is not something that a normal human being can handle. Um, uh, fame makes you lose your mind. Uh, and part of it is that you start seeking validation from all these people that are hitting like, or all these people that are cheering for you. And, uh, I, I think very few people can actually sustain their own human integrity, uh, when they reach a certain yeah. level of fame. And so what I'm saying is that a lot of these preachers will go in sincere, uh, but it's huh. quicksand. It's very hard to, to, to keep yourself, uh, with your head above water. It's very hard not to lose yourself. Whoa. And so that is always going to be there also. Umar, let me ask you, I mean, if I could, um, yeah. I, I, you know, I, you, you talked about, you know, the kind of shared experience you and Zucky have. I mean, I, I take it yeah. you, like me, as someone who's been involved in the Muslim community in some capacity for a number of decades. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if not, if not uh, as an involved activist, but certainly as a consumer of, uh, of, of, of knowledge that was being... Um, you know, provided whether it was via ISNA or ICNA and the kind of preachers and speakers that we had growing up in the 80s and 90s, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was that cult of personality or was that, uh, uh, what did you call it? The, the, uh, the, the public, the, thank you, celebrity preacher phenomenon. Was it always present or is it something yeah. new? Uh, it was always there. It's just that the platform has gotten bigger with YouTube, meaning... I mean, I remember the day. Let's just call out names. So you're saying that Imam Siraj, yeah. Wahad, growing up, like hearing Jamal yeah. Badawi or Imam Siraj or Abdullah Idris, or let's even say Sheikh Hamza, although, it, well, that, that gets a little, okay, but let's, let's just go back to the old guard, right? I mean, like, uh, think back to the Isna days, let's say in the 90s. Uh, I was I there. Yeah. Oh, no, I was there. So, so Imam Siraj would be walking around Isna and yeah. like 30 people would be walking behind him. Um, and then along comes Hamza Yusuf and half of Isna would be walking behind him. Yeah. Right. This is, this is before any of these people had much of a presence on television. Correct. Right. This is before. Muslim and this is before social people. media. This is before YouTube. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And before all these international, like Ikra TV, Peace TV, this is before all of that. Oh yeah. Right. And then I think Anwar al Aulaki was the first person to come out with celebrity. Oh, with, see, I'm saying celebrity with, uh, with compact disc lecture sets. Hamza Yusuf had his. Yeah. Imam Siraj. I learned so much of my Islam from those Juma khutbas. Oh man. You go. See, now yeah. you're talking my language. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yes, yes, exactly. Cassette and, tape boots at Isna. I mean that, well, I mean, to be honest yeah. with you, that's how I first was introduced. Not only to Imam Siraj, but also Sheikh Hamza Alhambra. Uh -huh. Productions, right? Yes. Used to sell those cassettes. Uh, even uh -huh. Imam Zaid Shakir. I mean, so a lot of people. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, go and on. Then, and so, you know, for when when I was in Tanzim Islami, I was very close to Israr Ahmed, and I used to see how people would conduct themselves around him. I mean, you would think that like rays of light were shooting from from uh, from his whole being in terms of the way people would conduct themselves around him. And and I that in my experience was true for almost every one of our celebrity preachers. I, I should also mention, I'm calling these people celebrity preachers not to minimize their knowledge. I'm calling them celebrity preachers in terms of what the people are consuming from them. Correct. Uh, they're consuming charisma. I mean, Dr. Israr was a powerful speaker. Sheikh Hamza is a powerful speaker. You know, all these people are very, very charismatic speakers. And we are buying charisma and we think we're gaining ilm in the process. Mm -hmm. right? Knowledge, knowledge. And, yeah. Yeah. and so, Sacred knowledge. so the point being that, that culture uh, has been there, that culture has been there in many parts of the Muslim world. And if it was not the process of someone preaching, it would be the process of someone reciting, right? I mean, uh, Michael Sells has a point in one of his books. He's, he's a uh, professor at UFC, you know, Chicago, Brilliant. where he was, he was younger and travel, walking around in Egypt and he saw these people watching televisions uh, in the stores and he thought they were watching a soccer game, but they're all listening to somebody recite, recite the Quran, right? It's always been there. And, and a lot of it is beneficial, right? Uh, but when you start elevating the status of someone beyond human, uh, 
and in some cases even beyond the status of the prophet peace be upon him you see this among some of the goofy sufi tariqas not so much the orthodox tariqas but the goofy sufi tariqas <laughs> goofies where they'll elevate yeah. their sheikh yeah they'll elevate their sheikh above of the prophet himself peace be upon him you're probably going down a harmful path both for your your afterlife and for this world because you're probably actually shutting off your mind and so so that culture has always been there and that culture will always be mm -hmm. there because mm -hmm. uh, I think that's also human nature. And in terms of this collective sense of discontent and dispossession that we often have as Muslims in the world, even in America, even though so many of us are like in the 1%, um, I think people are looking for a Mahdi, a savior. And, and so they want someone to, to like lead their way. And so well, I would even argue, I the yeah, I mean, like you said, it's been there from the very, I, mean, I would even argue from the very beginning, because I mean, one of the earliest sort of issues that the Muslim community wrestles with after the death of the Prophet, peace be upon him, is sort of the issue of infallibility, right? Is, is what happens to that prophetic infallibility, can it rest with an individual, or does it rest in a community? And this, this schism between the early Shi and, and, and the Sunni split, uh, I would argue, sort of comes down to that issue of infallibility, whether it's through a bloodline, through, uh, through uh, you know, uh, the family of the Prophet exclusively, or does it rest in the jama'a, in the community, right, as a whole? So, Yeah, all those, all those would be in the mix of the conversation. What is the status given to the companions of the Prophet? That's right. Upon him in That's right. Their loyalty of transmitting That's what right. saying. What is the status given to specific descendants? Yeah, that would be either. And so... Yeah, and I mean, who is the ultimate celebrity preacher in history? It's the Pharaoh. Yeah, right. right, right. There, it is. So. <laughs> there you go. There you go. So I, I'm sorry, I, I took you away from you. Were, we were talking about solutions, or, or, or so. Yeah, I mean, so the, the key point being that uh, there have been attempts to to put something together, but I think they're hard to implement. Got it. And so what? Uh, uh, because the people who do community work are juggling way too many things. And then, uh, so what has to happen is that people have to come forth and are willing to be at the same table to focus on this specific issue. Like if you have been a victim or if you've heard that someone's been a victim of, of, the, of abuse by a preacher or if you, if you have reason to believe that a preacher is abusing, then you go to this institution, right? And then they have the tools, resources, both in terms of professionals and financial resources to investigate and then to, uh, to do whatever it needs to be done, whether it means to go to law enforcement, whether it means to get uh, litigation involved, or if it means to ostracize someone temporarily or permanently. I think that's the only way this will get addressed. Hmm. And, and another point to think about, the reason I'm saying that celebrity culture is going to stay there um, doesn't mean that we just give up. It's just like, all right, if you, if a crime has been committed, you know, you're not going to be able to solve all crime. Um, but so if a murder has been committed, you know, you're not going to solve all murders, even if you put an institution in place, but you will try to make the lives of some people better and hopefully draw attention to, to a problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, I mean, I guess any, any sort of imparting closing sort of adv advice to people, I mean, as we kind of navigate sure. these conversations even. Mm-hmm. I mean, so I, I love hearing a good speech as much as anyone else. I don't like giving speeches. I'm not exaggerating when I say I've given thousands of speeches. May Allah tell I accept all of them. I mean, uh, but I mean, but um, uh, I mean, I still always get stage fright. But I love listening to a really good speech. There's the Hamza Yusuf speech from Isna from I think 2003, 2004 that I probably listened to like 50 <laughs> times just because it was so charismatic, yeah. right? And so that I'm not even saying it's a problem. I enjoy it as much as everyone else. Uh, but if, you, if you're turning to someone for knowledge, the further they live away from you physically, the less they are able to address your reality. And the more you might find yourself idealizing them. That's just human. And so what you want to try to do for the gain of Islamic knowledge and what that is also meaning for the process of personal transformation is look for local teachers. They are there more than we might give them credit for. And I completely acknowledge that, uh, that it's much easier for me as a man to find a teacher than it is for a woman to find a teacher. Uh, and, and so I understand why there's an additional need for a lot of these things, especially for people who are overseas in, in different places. But the point is that be very honest with yourself about what you're gaining from the preacher. And the second point, no matter whether the, the teacher is in front of you or if the teacher is on a screen, 
if you don't find yourself implementing what the teacher's teaching, but instead you find yourself getting in a quote unquote Iman rush, then you're probably not actually getting any Iman rush. It's probably like, you know, some dopamine release in your brain. Um, Cause our Dean is one of embodiment, meaning you get this small, 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 small nugget of knowledge and then you implement it. And then you gain another nugget and you implement it and then transformation it takes place. Takes place. Right, right, right. Uh, okay, so I mean, I think that was advice for people consuming like the the like knowledge from uh, personalities. Yeah. I, I I mean, I guess specifically. Okay. With, <laughs> no, no, no. I think that's a, those were excellent points, and I think that uh, certainly if, uh, related to what I what I did want you to comment on, which is as we as community members are now having conversations, whether it's about Noman Ali Khan or about some future personality or about. Abdullah Salim, like what are some, I, 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 yeah. I wanted you to call, okay. uh, like just what are some sort of nuances within the conversation or uh, things that we should sure. be watching for? Okay, so. Pitfalls so to avoid, things. if you will, uh, yeah. Well, uh, well, the first pitfall is regarding perpetrators. Uh, I honestly, honestly, honestly wish that they would have the sense to own up to their, their indiscretions or their crimes. And there's a few reasons for this. One, for their own sake, two, for the sake of their followers who are putting in all this time and effort to, to defend them. Uh, but also because they will find that if you embrace your wrong right now, uh, you're not going to have to cover things up over and over again and turn it into an, a bigger, uh, to a, turn it into an even bigger problem. The cover up, they say, is like worse than the crime. And so this, I wish, and also I wish these preachers that are doing wrong would come forward and admit it. And even say, all right, you know, it's not enough for me to say that I'm human, but there are institutional problems in terms of how we're addressing this. And, uh, and then call out everyone else, not necessarily by name, but call out this problematic behavior. That's the problem. Uh, that's what I would wish from the preachers. And then from the victims, um, please know that, uh, that no matter what, even if you are alone, okay, uh, Allah Ta'ala is not going to let this, uh, these actions escape. If there's anything that I can do for you, then you can contact me. Just do Google Muslim Loyola Chaplain and you'll find my contact information. Uh, but for a community member, if you're hearing of something like this, you have an obligation to do something. Because the easiest way to think about this is suppose your daughter uh, was abused in any capacity and you found out that other people knew about it and they did nothing about it, right? That's just, I mean, anybody can understand that. And then uh, people who are professionals in this type of work, whether we're talking about professionals in sexual violence, whether we're talking about professionals in, in psychology, uh, uh, psychiatry, and attorneys who deal with this stuff, uh, uh, if any of you can really take an initiative to try to put together a committee, you'll probably get a lot farther than, than, than I have thus far to address these things so people can turn to you uh, to, uh, rather than, you know, this miscellaneous chaplain, uh, uh, in Chicago to, to address these things. But overall, what am I really saying that our obligation as a community is to be people of the highest level of character, right? No one cares if you pray 5 million prayers, uh, but they will care if your character is upright or not. And, and, uh, if you're looking at it from the perspective of Datwa, or if you're looking at it from the perspective of social benefit, or if you're just looking at the perspective of integrity of society, we have to have the high standard of character, Un understanding that every one of us commits sins and every one of us uh, has space for Tauba. So I don't know if that's the answer you're looking for. No, no, it, it is. It is. Um, and uh, so as of now, your involvement. Oh, I got one more thing. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh, okay. please, when, when please, you please. When hear about a case, whether we're talking about Abdullah Salim, whether we're hearing about no, uh, Noman Ali Khan, whether you're hearing about Tariq Ramadan, uh, evaluate what you really have to gain by jumping into the conversation. Uh, if you're not part of the investigation, if you're not part of, 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 of uh, helping the, yeah, 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 uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, um, uh, you should pray that, you know, people who need healing find healing, pray to people who need justice will find justice and people's imams will be protected and all of this will actually help the community grow together rather than than to split apart but otherwise you're just wasting a whole lot of your own time uh i don't know how people have so much time to to be able to be pontificating and and using all their knowledge from law and order and csi to to answer these questions but but they do i mean if it doesn't if it doesn't concern you you don't need to get into the conversation even if it's someone you revere
That that's probably the biggest uh, uh, advice you can give. Law and order and CSI. Well, uh, I don't know, Zeki. I I I think we, you know we 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 covered a lot of ground, uh, and I, I would like uh, for our listeners to take uh, Omar up on, on his offer to, uh, if you do know of if, if you either yourself are a victim of of any kind of abuse, or if if if, uh, if you know of someone, then uh, I think uh, Omar is a wonderful resource. As are resources within your own communities. I imagine uh, there are therapists and counselors, uh, as well as people involved in the legal in the law enforcement. Uh, as well, who you can contact uh, if, if, if anything like that has taken place. Um, but um, I, I appreciate uh, th- you coming on, Omer, and kind of t- talking uh, about not only these two per- particular cases, but I think a lot of relevant topics, relevant issues for the community right now um, as we wrestled through a lot of this, uh, whether it was the, whether it's the instance of, or issue of, uh, secret polygamy and, 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 or, or, or abuse. Uh, I think it's important to have a voice like yourself, um, come on and, 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 and discuss it. Yeah, I appreciate, I appreciate being on. I appreciate that you guys are discussing this. And also, uh, I had this interview last week with the med mom Luke's and some people also offered criticism in the, yeah. the things that I saw that I, I saw that. And if anyone has criticisms, by all means, I do really believe in my heart that I take all criticisms as constructive. So by all means, please correct me if, if anything I've said is incorrect too. And Milita will accept all of our, our mistakes and our, our request for forgiveness and all of our efforts. I mean, I mean, yeah. Um, yeah, I think for those who don't know, Mad Mamelukes is another podcast, uh, I think, based out of Chicago. Um, and so uh, Umar was, on a, was a guest on that show uh, recently. Uh, Umar, before we go... Um, it- I know, obviously, you're you're pretty active on social media and stuff. Can you let people know on what you're... On Twitter, I think my name is just Mozuffer, M-O-Z like zebra, A like apple, F like Frank, F like Frank, A-R. Uh, Facebook, I usually don't accept friend requests if I don't know the person or if I don't know someone really well who knows the person, uh, but you can still send me uh, messages. And then, of course, um, the easiest way to, to, to find me uh, is um, just Google Muslim Chaplain Loyola, and then you'll find me. Uh, with my email address, omazuffer at luc.edu. And uh, uh, Pervez, you want to tell people where they can get a hold of us? That's right. So uh, comments, feedback, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at diffusecongruence at gmail.com um, or you can go to our Facebook page, engage us there, um, facebook.com slash diffusecongruence. If you like the show, please do share it with others and uh, give us a star rating on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, wherever you find fine podcast well with that on behalf of my co-host Pervez Ahmed and our guest Umar Muzaffar this has been Diffuse Congruent and we will catch you next time <laughs>